Praise the Lord. So today we're going to be discussing, uh, well, my discourse is going to be concerning the law of associations. The law of associations. Um, I want to help us understand the concept of associations and be equipped with the information, uh, the relevant information to make our relationships or our associations rather effective. And effective means serving the purpose for which it was designed. So relationships or associations have a purpose. And when you have effective associations, let me use the term associations. When you have effective associations, it means your relationships, well, I'm mixing up terms. When you have effective associations, it means your associations are doing what God designed associations to do. So, so you can have ineffective associations and you can have effective associations. See, if you have a product, there's a um, there's a design for the product. It's supposed to work a certain way. You know, if you click on the uh, well, the iPhone now, if you slide up the home button on your iPhone and it doesn't uh, do what it's supposed to do, you you get worried because you know the phone has a certain function. When you um, click on certain app icons, you expect a reaction from the phone. When the phone doesn't react, it means it's not the phone's not operating effectively. It's not operating as it was designed to operate. And so you call Apple, or you call right, someone who can fix the iPhone, so forth and so on. So when things are ineffective, you usually are troubled because um, you can no longer use it for what it, it's supposed to serve in your life. Now, to understand this concept, we're going to look at uh, and study the first human relationship in Scripture in the book of Genesis, which was the relationship between Adam and Eve. Very foundational, something you should understand about uh, studying concepts is that to understand a concept uh, in its fullness, most times it is wise to go back to the beginning or where that concept was first mentioned, not just in scripture, but in, in human history and time. Um, and so because you, you usually, well, in reference to scripture, you usually have the purest understanding and revelation of that particular concept when you go back to its beginning to understand what was God's original idea behind this concept because even in scripture certain things have been manipulated and by men certain things have been changed by god himself on the behalf of men but they don't serve its original purpose but because of the infirmity of the flesh god had to switch certain things but if we go back to the beginning we'll understand god's original purpose everything is always understood from its foundations where did it begin where did it begin rather you know physicists call it uh, first principles thinking thinking from foundation from where it began so the first human relationship genesis chapter 2 and we're going to read from verse 15 verse 18 and verses 20 through 22 so the first verse says uh, so the lord god took the man he had made and settled him in the garden of eden to cultivate it to keep it so god takes adam and puts him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. One. Two. Now the Lord God said, it is not good. The word good here means beneficial. It is not beneficial for the man to be alone. So there's God, there's the man, Adam, and then there's the garden. God is not saying that it's not beneficial for Adam to be alone. So what is God's solution? He says, I will make him, Adam, a helper. And the Amplified says, one who balances him. A counterpart who is suitable and complementary for him. Adam, God, garden. God puts Adam in garden. God contemplates and says, Adam shouldn't be alone. I'm going to make him a helper. Okay, two. Now three. And the man, Adam, gave names to... So at this point, God has only proposed an idea amongst himself. Remember, I taught about the doctrine of the Trinity. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are only still just discussing the concept of creating a partner for man. He hasn't yet actually been formed yet, or she, I should say, hasn't been formed yet. And the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper that was suitable for him. Four, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. So God, in creating woman, took from Adam's rib 
and formed woman from man. And that's why he named her woman, because the word woman means another man or a man that came out of men. That's what it means. So the Lord God picked, because women are, man is not, uh, we're not talking about man, the gender, but man, the species. Women are men in, in, in species, but of course we speak of the female gender, but it's still a male, just a male that serves a different function. Male, female, man, woman. It's a man, it's a male, but just a male that serves a different function. Not here to talk about that. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh of that place. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, Adam, he had made into a woman, and he brought her and presented her to the man. Now note here the first thing in this relationship is that God took the man and he put him in a garden and gave him an assignment. And the assignment again was to cultivate and to keep it. Now in this assignment, uh, so here's God, here's man. God gives man an assignment. And in the man fulfilling his assignment, he also goes on to give him another assignment. And God told Adam to name all the animals, right? And so Adam was naming all the animals. And so God was, Adam was busy doing that which God had commanded him to do. And in that Adam's occupation, God found out that Adam, in fact, needed a helper uh, suitable for him. And so this, the first relationship came as a proposal, as a solution to a man who was unable to accomplish his assignment without a helper. And so relationship, the concept of an association itself is from that pure relation of what an association or a relationship is supposed to be is that somebody a new relationship coming into your life is supposed to be a solution to a problem in your life there's supposed to be something they're able to do in your life that you wouldn't be able to do for yourself and that what god has called you to do there are certain things that you won't be able to do in that calling by yourself you need helpers as we call them we call them destiny helpers people that will help you eve wasn't created for adam because adam asked for her God created Eve out of necessity. The first human relationship was created out of necessity, not out of wanting to have fun or wanting to go to the movies with somebody or wanting to giggle with somebody. The first human relationship was created because a man was focusing on his assignment and God said, this man won't be able to complete his assignment unless I give him a helper. This is the first human relationship. Similar to when you're in school and you have a project and the project is too laborious in itself for one person to take on the role of finishing the project. So you need other partners, maybe two, three, or four, or one other partner to help you finish the project. If you are able to look at your life and the assignment on your life as a project, there are relationships that you will have to cultivate by God. God will have to send people because you will not be able to do it by yourself. Why does God do this? God does this because he wants to create human interdependence. It is the principle of interdependence. He wants men to be dependent upon one another. Not as they're dependent on God, but as they know that one man in himself doesn't host all that's necessary to complete everything that must be completed in their life. Because if that was the case, then I wouldn't need anybody in my life. I don't need to listen to anybody. I don't need to read about any book. I don't need to consult anybody. I can walk this walk on my own. It would make human relationships unnecessary. So God wanting to make human relationships necessary because he wants mankind to be a family. He wants us to all love each other and need each other and desire to have companionship with each other. He makes us, gives us limitations that other people are strong in, or excuse me, he gives us areas of weakness that other people have as strengths. So my weakness is his strength. My strength is his weakness. So we supply for one another. The Bible says, he that had much had nothing left over. He that little had little uh, uh, had enough. I think it's something like that. The idea is that whoever has too much, he'll give to the person that has too little. Whoever has too little will have enough. We help each other. So what I can do, you do for me. What you can do, I do for you. In fact, that's how business works, isn't it? You want something, I want something. So I get what you want or I get what I want from you. You get what you want from me because we get an exchange. That's how relationships work. Relationships are about exchange, 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 give and take, exchange, exchange. See, and so this is the purest understanding of revelation of what a, a real relationship is supposed to be. It's supposed to be somebody that helps you to bear your cross, somebody that helps you to be able to complete your assignment. 
Somebody in a relay race that helps to push you to keep you going. Somebody while you're running the relay, they give you water to drink because you're, you're gassing out. When Jesus Christ was carrying his literal physical cross to Calvary, a black man called Simon the Niger from, he was, uh, I think he was Liberian, had to help him carry his cross. This is Jesus the Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. God come in the flesh needed a man to help him carry his cross. You would think Jesus would just carry it by himself, uh huh? He needed someone else to help carry his cross. You see? And so if you look at your life like a task and assignment, you're going to need helpers. Um, um, so the idea, so let me, let me also lay down this concept of how life and relationships have a synergy. So there's first the vision of God concerning your life. There's what God sees concerning your life, what your life is supposed to accomplish. And then there's the blueprint for your life. If you look at your life like a house, your life is a house and every building has a blueprint or what all needs to be done, what is the design, what all needs to be done to erect this building. And then there are the tools, right? You can't build a house just by envisioning it. You need tools to actually build the house. And relationships are one of these tools to be able to complete the vision of God concerning your life. You see, these are one of these tools. I'm not saying humans are tools. I'm just saying it metaphorically that if you, if you look at metaphorically your life as a house, uh, relationships would be akin to tools that help you build a house. You can't build a house with one tool. You see, you can't build a house with just your hands. You need other People, in fact, actually, well, let's just say you're actually really building a physical house. You need people to help you. You can't build a house by yourself. See, even if you build a house by yourself, let's say you need tools then. You can't just be you, your mind, and your hands. It's not possible. You need something outside yourself. That's how it always works. Uh, I think it's impossible to do anything just by yourself. You know, uh, everything you do, you're able to do because of a relationship. Yeah, I promise you. Even if it's God, it still counts as a relationship. Me being able to see right now is because of my relationship with God. Even if you're not born again, God is the one that gave man eyes. Everything you're doing right now, it is the product of some relationship, either because of a man or because of God. It's because of knowing about or some relationship being available to you. There's nobody that can do anything by himself. I'm breathing right now because God gave me lungs. I am, my blood is pumping through my veins right now because God created systems in my body to make it so. I have a phone because a man created uh, the technology. Everything I have is because of, of some kind of relationship. Well, I don't have to know the person intimately, but a human being is contributing to the welfare that I experience in my life. We live and exist based on relationships, whether our vertical relationship with God or our horizontal relationship with man. It's all about relationships. It's about relationships. Let me see. Now, Jesus, for example, I'm going to give an example where Jesus himself Let's see how much he valued relationships in his own life. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 and 13, the Bible says, Now at this time, Jesus went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. Now, if you spend the whole night in prayer, it must mean that whatever he's praying for is very important. When day came, the Bible says he called his disciples and selected 12 of them, whom he also named apostles, special messengers, personally chosen representatives. So the idea, or well, let me also read this scripture too, John 15, 15. I do not call you servants any longer for, no, let me read that later. So the idea is that um, in Jesus's ministry, he had to choose and build and equip 12 men because eventually, well, Jesus only did ministry for about three years. I think it was about three and a half years. And eventually he would ascend back to heaven. But the problem is that what Jesus brought us wasn't just a religious experience. He's bringing a faith, a compendium of beliefs. He's bringing a gospel, a good news. He's bringing the Holy Spirit. There are many things that came with Jesus Christ. How will these things pass down to other men? All right? So the only way that, for example, if we take the doctrine of Jesus Christ, what he taught, the only way for what he taught to be passed down is if men pass it down. You see, if I want to pass down my belief system, it has to be passed down through men. And what he did was build 12 men, strategic relationships to be able to fulfill the vision of his life. It's not enough for Jesus just to die for the world. The world has to hear about it because the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But the scripture says, how will they hear if a preacher is not sent? So a preacher has to preach to you for you to even hear to have faith. And so even if Jesus died for the world, if you don't hear about the gospel of salvation, it will make, any, it will make no difference to your life. It's like a store having a, a deal, a, a sale. If you don't hear about the sale, it makes no difference. Yes, the sale's there, but if nobody tells you about it, that's why they have 
advertisement campaign. So preachers are like advertisers. They go and advertise what God has done by Jesus Christ. And so he had to raise these 12 men to advertise the gospel. So even after he left, he had people advertising the gospel so that people would still be able to receive Christ in their life. You see what that is? So, but the strategic relationships, what if Jesus died and he didn't raise anybody? He just died and nobody was able, he didn't have any disciples. Nobody would ever, you and I wouldn't even know who he is. He would have died in Jerusalem, nobody would ever hear about him. Yes, people in that time would know about him, but it would have never passed down. It would maybe just be some stories left and right, but he wouldn't be famous. It wouldn't be anything that would touch a global scale because he hasn't raised people to pass down that posterity. It's very, it's very important. He built 12 strategic relationships. You see, this is Jesus, not, this is Jesus Christ I'm talking about. And he's depending upon these 12 relationships to pass down what he wants to give to the world. And so he couldn't just do it by himself. This is very important. Many people trivialize relationships. They just think it's just a way to just have people to have fun with, have people to giggle with. And that's all wonderful. I'm not saying that's wrong, but you, you, you can't stray from the original purpose of relationship. All those things are secondary. Those things are later down the, the list of important things to, to take note of. The first, the most important thing to take note of is number one, what is God's vision of concerning your life? What is your life supposed to achieve and accomplish? Number two, who are the people called to help you achieve and accomplish these things? It's just that simple. It's just that simple. Relationships are about, f number one, your focus on your vision and then people that can help you to be able to achieve that vision. It has to be strategic. It's not just about having friends and laughing and giggling. Especially for us younger people, we, we have this way of just, we just think it's about having fun all the time. It's a very childish, now respectfully speaking, it's a very childish mindset. That's how children think. Everything is about fun and entertainment. It's about having fun and giggling and laughing and hanging around. It's not about hanging around, no. This life is not about hanging around. You have to have a Christian world. How did Jesus see life? He said, I've come to this world not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. So if he's in this earth, he had one mission, is to do what God has called him to do. And his 12 friends, his only friends were 12 men. Why? Because those were the men that were going to help him to complete his mission. That's what friendship is about. It's having strategic relationships that help you to complete your mission. There's, you have to have a strategic approach to relationships, like tools to build a house. If I'm building a house, you don't just grab random tools and throw them around anyhow. I need specific tools to solve specific problems that I have. This is very important. Now, as far as effective associations are concerned, there are three major decisions to make when it comes to associations. Take note of this. Number one, there are, well, uh, associations. <laughs> in fact, in terms of the decision to associate with somebody, disassociations and there are limited associations. Um, again, as far as if making or building effective relationships are concerned, there are three major decisions that you will always have to make. It is the decision to associate, the di decision to disassociate, and the decision to limit an association. See, and we're gonna hear, discuss a little bit about when to make an association and a disassociation. Now, if I give an example of a house, again, building a house, if you were building a house and you wanted to understand um, or say you're, you're building a house and you now are looking for tools, um, you wouldn't pick tools based on which tools look nice, had the nicest color, smelled the best. You would pick the tools based on which tools help you to achieve the goal of building the house. You would have a very dispassionate approach to it, very emotionless approach to it. It's just which tools help me build the house, you see? It's just a very simple approach. That's how friendships are supposed to be. It's not about, oh, they make me laugh. Oh, they're my childhood friend. That makes absolutely no difference. I'm not trying to be insensitive, but it really doesn't make any difference. What does that have anything to do with the vision of God concerning your life? It, it just, it's, so, it's absolutely irrelevant. The goal is to accomplish the vision or the mission that God has given you. If those relationships don't help you do that, they're not supposed to be your relationships. If I picked up a tool that doesn't help me build my house, I would throw it to the side, dispassionately. 
I'm not saying throw, throw people, I'm not saying abuse people, but you understand what I'm saying. When it comes to tools, when it comes to inanimate objects, we have an emotionalist disposition to it. It's just, obviously this tool doesn't help me build my house. I don't need this tool to build the house. You would discard it. But when it comes to relationships, even when people know it is literally a relationship that is pungent to their destiny, it is a detrimental relationship, they'll still keep the relationship even though they know it doesn't help them because of the emotionalism around it. Oh, but it's my... Oh, but ah, but my other oh, funny or oh, the, all these justifications. You wouldn't justify having a bad tool. Oh, but it's my favorite tool. It doesn't help you build the house. You would just be wasting your time. So the real problem here is the emotionality behind it. It's the emotionalism of oh, but they're my friend. Oh, but this. Oh, but that. If it was a tool, we wouldn't be passionate about it. We wouldn't be emotional about it. It's just this tool does not help me build my house. Poop. This tool does. I'll take this one. I'll take that one. Push that one to the side. Let's build the house. But it's difficult for people to look at relationships from that dispassionate perspective. Because Jesus didn't choose the 12 apostles emotionally. He didn't say, that guy's handsome, he should be my friend. Oh, this one has money, he should be my friend. I like this guy. It was dispassionate. He prayed. He even chose them from a spiritual perspective. He didn't choose them based on who he liked. He chose them based on who God knew was best for his destiny. So it's even a spiritual decision. You don't just pick friends because even just because they're Christians or because they're nice people. No, sir. You have to be more strategic than that. Jesus prayed the whole night to choose 12 friends. People have 50 friends. They haven't prayed for any one of them. He prayed for one whole night to choose 12 men. 12 men. Do you know Jesus did not have any friends until he was 33 years old? Because actually, if I want to be accurate, he, even the 12 apostles weren't his friends until the third year. I can show you in scripture. He says, now you are my friends if you do what I say. That means for the entire three years, they weren't his friends. He was training them. They weren't his friends yet. They had to mature to become his friends. Look at the standard that Jesus has. You can't just be his friend anyhow. You have to be... Oh. John 15, 15. Jesus speaking, talking to the 12 apostles. I do not call you servants any longer. This is the third year of his ministry. So he's known these people for three years. And he's look what he's saying. I do not call you servants any longer, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you my friends. I have. I'm now doing it. Because I have revealed to you everything that I've heard to my, from my father. In another scripture, he says that you are my friends if you do what I command. But Jesus himself said, I only do what the father says to do. So what he's really saying is that you are only my friend because you are, you are obeying heaven's vision for my life. So look at the standard of his relationships. It's based on strategically approaching the fulfillment of the vision of God concerning his life and relationships that help him to fulfill that vision. It's, it's very, it's not an emotional thing. It's not about my old friend from, it's that, that's so irrelevant. You wouldn't say, I know this tool doesn't help me build the house, but it's my favorite tool from when my dad gave it to me. It's my favorite tool from back in 2002. It, you, nobody says that stuff. It doesn't, nobody, people look at you like, what does it have to, like, I don't care. Like, we're, we can't use it. So what's the point? Like, imagine we're building a house and you have this one tool that literally doesn't, wouldn't do anything, but you insist on holding it. Even, and you, you need that hand to hold the actual hammer that helps you to build the house. But you insist on holding this tool that is useless, but you just, but that's my favorite tool. Dude, people look at you like you're like a child. Dude, put the tool down and get serious. It's childish. You would expect that children to do those things. The holding on to a teddy bear that doesn't even work anymore. The sound doesn't even work. You would expect for children to do those things. Holding on to things that aren't profitable. It's not for grown, mature people in thought. Let's see. So when do you make an association? Back to my point, I'm talking about the three major decisions to make when it comes to relationships, which are associations, disassociations, and limited associations. You make associations when these relationships help you to complete the mission on your life, what God has sent you in the world to do. These relationships help you to fulfill that mission, period. That's an association. When do you disassociate? When those relationships don't help you to fulfill the mission on your life. It's not, it's just, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not theoretical physics. It's not rocket science. It's just simple common sense principle, but it's scarcely applied. As simple as that sounds, many people, and I'm, I'm not trying to speak this in a condescending way, but many people aren't willing to make that decision. Very few people edit the relationships that they sit down and actually examine the relationships. They just accept what it is. They don't look at it from a futuristic perspective. Where will these relationships take me based 
on my destiny? Are these relationships that somebody who knows they're called to be a president should have, sincerely speaking? I'm just saying, uh, for example, somebody who knows they're called to become a president, are these relationships that I should sustain to help me to become a global influencer? These people are local in thought. They're thinking of small things. They're concerned with who scored two goals like yesterday. I'm trying to have a global mindset, concerned with global economics and politics and global transformation and, 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 and building political structures and systems. That's what my mind is. They're thinking about how many points LeBron scored yesterday. I can't be friends with them. God has called me, for example, maybe, for example, he's called you to be a president. You're supposed to be thinking globally, but your friends are local in their mindset. They're thinking about small mundane things about uh, which which friend said this about that one, gossip and this one. And, and they're believers. I'm not talking about unbelievers. But yeah, you can't. I, 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 I mean, how can I even sustain that relationship? It's going to affect you. The Bible says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts. It didn't say it might corrupt. It can corrupt. Maybe it will. No, I'm it says bad company corrupts definitively bad uh, good morals. So you might have good intentions. Somebody with good intentions with bad relationships will do bad things. You can have good intentions. If you have bad relationships, you will do bad things. Those bad relationships will edit your emotions. It will edit your, your intentions and shift them to conform to relationships that you hold. You will conform to your associations. I didn't say you might, you will. I'm saying that on the authority of scripture. He says, walk with wise men and become. He didn't say you might become. You will become wise if you walk with wise men. But he says, a companion of fools shall be destroyed. He didn't say he might be destroyed. The, when the Bible in the King James says shall, it means it's a law. Every, not a law, a law. It means every time it will have that result. A somebody who has relationships with foolish people. What's who's a foolish person? It's not an insult, it's a description. A foolish person is a person that does not value wisdom and is proven by the lack of zeal for knowledge. They don't learn. They, they go 365 days, they don't pick up one book. They're a fool. No, I'm not saying, I'm not, that's what the Bible said. The Bible, says, the Bible says a foolish man despises knowledge. That's one of the proofs of foolishness. They don't have, they don't value knowledge. They don't value uh, increasing in your in the wisdom of God operating on your life. They just are okay with just living and moving around. They don't have a heavy investment in knowledge. And he says, if you, and because they're ignorant, they make ignorant decisions and have bad results in life. He says, if you associate with those people, you will be destroyed by life, not by God, by life. Life will destroy you. You disassociate. This is very important. You see? So what help, what, what stops people from picking the right relationships is emotions. Is emotions. Is, is, is emotionalism. But there's a place you have to get where you have to choose your future over your feelings. You may feel like I want to be friends with them because they're my friend from back in the day. But, um, well, they've done. Now, there are also what are called limited associations. Where it may not be as simple to just cut off relationships. You may have to sustain a relationship but at a distance. Maybe it's a, excuse me, if it's a family member or somebody that's just really close to your family. It's not, you can't just say, I'm cutting them off. It's not that simple. You may have to limit the association. What does that mean? It means like how a country has borders. They're, they may still have a neighboring country. But because of that border, they can edit what comes in and what stays out. They can still choose what comes in and what stays out. There's not everything that comes in and not everything goes out. So when you have a limited association, they're close enough to know that you still have some kind of relationship, but it's far enough to know that what is in them that I don't want in me is staying there. And what's in me that I don't want to go to them is staying here. There's a borderline. So it's a relationship where maybe we're not talking all the time. We're not, I'm, I don't want to receive from your foolishness. I don't want your foolishness to enter my mind. So I keep a safe space. It's a limited association. I still, yes, when I see you somewhere, we'll shake hands. I love you, family. But, but eh, your mindset is punched into my destiny, perhaps. You see, it's very possible. So there are associations, disassociations, people you just say separate. And then there are limited associations. I'm going to finish with also this, take note of this, uh, major relationships. The three major relationships you should take note of are number one, mentors. Mentors are people, um, mentors are people that have achieved what God has called you to achieve. The Bible says, follow them who through faith and patience have obtained. 
obtain the promises. What does that mean? You're trying to obtain something. That person has obtained it. Learn from them. For example, if I'm trying to gain 10 pounds of muscle, my friend has gained 10 pounds of muscle. So he can mentor me. He can teach me how it's done. Instead of trying to go it my own way and trying to figure it out and make all the mistakes that he already made, I can learn from his mistakes, erase those mistakes, and do it in less time than he did and be more efficient. Then, do you understand? Mentor, somebody that has obtained what you're trying to obtain. Very important relationship to know. It's not everybody that's on your level that should be your, there's some people that should be above you, there are people that should be with you, there are people that should be below you. Mentors, and then the second level of relationships are called what we call friends usually, people that are with you. These are the people that are not above you, but they're with you. For example, if I wanted to become an Olympic athlete, uh, I may not, uh, my friends may not be my mentors because we're also, they're also with me in trying to become gold medalists. But because we're approaching the same thing, we have the same motif, we can help each other. We can help each other rise. Nobody's above anyone. We're all at the same level, but we can help each other rise. We can help train together, work out together, study film together, so forth and so on. Uh, stretch each other right not one person can stand as the mentor because they also haven't gotten a gold medal but we can help each other very important relationship to have why the relationship is important because the scripture says iron sharpeneth iron it means we're sharpening each other we're at the same level but we're sharpening each other as i'm sharpening you you're sharpening me back and we're just sharpening as we're sharpening each other we're getting sharper each one we're getting sharper See, so it's a give and take relationship. It's not just one person pouring into another person. It's two people pouring into each other. Mentorship is one person pouring into you. Friendship is two people pouring into each other. And then there's what's called having a mentee, the person that you are pouring into. So somebody should be pouring into you. You should be pouring into each other with somebody. You should also be pouring into somebody else. Because of the law of reciprocity. What you don't give, you can't receive. If you are unwilling to mentor people, you will not have mentors. In fact, God himself will restrict the grace for mentorship. Because he says, give and it shall be given unto you. So in this life, one of the golden rules is that whatever you want, give it first. If you want to be mentored well, mentor people. The little, Even if you just know little, teach little that you know to people. Because you're sowing seeds of kindness, sowing seeds of benevolence, sowing seeds that will eventually come back to you. If you take people under your care, even if you just know small, teach people small. God will also grant grace for you to locate accurate mentors that also can help you to get where you, get you to where you need to be. So it's just about reciprocity, passing down. If someone's teaching you, teach someone else. Someone's helping you, help someone else. Somebody sent you a, a, a sermon that changed your life, send it to somebody else. Don't just hold it for yourself, that's selfishness. Somebody sent you a message that blessed you, forward it to somebody else. Somebody sent you a scripture that blessed you, send it to somebody else. You should have mentors, you should have friends, but also have mentees, and you'll have a cycle going. People pouring into you, people that you're pouring in, or uh, pouring uh, amongst each other, pouring into each other, and then people that you're pouring into, then it becomes a cycle, just like that. Someone pouring into you, pouring into each other, pouring down other people, comes back up, cycle. He that watereth shall himself also be watered. It becomes a cycle, and that's how people grow. Having mentors, having friends, having mentees, just like that. Three very important relationships. Now, when it's all said and done, all this sounds nice, but again, the real, the profoundity of this information is not in the depth. It's not, this is, these are simple concepts. It's in the application. It's actually doing it. It's actually being able to sit down and examine your relationships. Where I'm going, can these people help me get, it's not about being arrogant or being prideful. It just, no, no, no. Pride and arrogance is not be. What is, okay, what is arrogance? What's pride? Pride is not trying to help your life. Pride is exalting yourself above the will of God. That's what pride is. One, and then pride can, and arrogance can also be thinking you're more than what you are. It's not having a humble opinion of, of yourself. But then understand that arrogance is not ignorance of your identity. There's a difference. Because being a king and behaving yourself like a king is not arrogant. Arrogance would be me behaving in a way that my life can't actually support. It's, it's, it's not having a, a humble opinion of who I actually am, you see? And so, how do I explain this? Um, Jesus gave a parable when uh, somebody invites people to a party and people can choose where they sit. And there are seats for 
uh, prestigious people, nobles, God in our seats for the humble people of life, the poor people. And he said, if you enter into a party, don't assume to be at the highest position. Take a lower position. That's that's humility. Arrogance would be you thinking, arrogance would be like you are probably in the middle somewhere, but you think you're something, so you'll go to the noble seats. That's arrogance. So you're not actually knowing exactly who you are. So arrogance, arrogance is actually first knowing who you are and then being who you are. Excuse me, humility, excuse me is knowing who you are and being who you are. Arrogance is knowing who you are, but then pushing yourself beyond who you actually are. So you can't actually support this thing you're trying to pretend to be. You're trying to act like you're something, but you're not, you see? But then also understanding that first, it starts with knowing who you are. Knowing you're a king and behaving like a king is not arrogance, because that's who you are. I, you, that's who I am, you see? Now, knowing that um, I'm a king and then trying to behave like I'm God Almighty is arrogance because that's not who I am. I'm not God Almighty. I'm, I'm trying to help you understand this. So because some people would think that maybe if I'm trying to say that, oh, I can't be friends with this person, it's like being arrogant. It's like saying that, oh, I'm too holy. It's not about being holier than somebody. They also, I understand that you also may not be good for their destiny too. It has nothing to do with them being a bad person. It's not about being a bad person. They can be a Christian who loves God passionately and there's still a bad relationship. So strategic relationships aren't about just knocking off bad people. They shouldn't be in your life anyway. It's talking about, it's, it's, it's more about, like again, having tools. There are tools that are designed to do certain things. There are people in this world who are designed to be your friends, designed to be your mentors, designed to be your mentees by God's strategic design. It's not about saying this person is not, it's not about looking at people from a, uh, judgmental perspective of I think that I'm more righteous than this person. It's not not looking at it from that perspective. It's more of the angle of I know where God has called me to be. I know what God showed me are the relationships that I need to have to be able to sustain that level. I know that I'm called to be a president. I love this person, but their mind is too local to be able to support a global mindset. I love them. But their mindset would be plunged into my destiny. That's not arrogance. That's being sincere with who you are and where you're going and who can't help you get there. Arrogance would be me now treating them as if they're lesser than I am. That's different. That's not me treating them as if I'm not more than them. I'm not better than them. It's just that I know where I'm called to be. I know what gets me there. Arrogance would be me, be, be me treating them like they're the scum of the earth now. I'm now demeaning them and downgrading them. You walk you, my friend. You're a bum. No, that's arrogance because it's not about being more than somebody. It's about having a destiny, a unique destiny that doesn't align with their own. It's not about being more or less than somebody. It's about being unique. So it's more of uniqueness than being more or less. It's about being different than my destiny not being congruent with their destiny. It's not about I am better or worse or I'm better or he's worse. It's I'm different than him. We're not kindred. We don't meet together. We don't match. The Bible says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Our spirits don't align. We don't believe the same things. We don't see life the same way. I'm not saying I'm better than them. I'm not saying they're worse than me, but we don't agree. We can't walk together. It's just that simple. So it's not arrogance. It's not about I'm better than. It's about we just have unique paths that can't align to each other. I have to be global in thought. I'm going to counsel presidents, for example. I'm going to counsel nations, for example. I'm saying just for example. I, this person, their mind can't even con conceive. They're not even thinking. They don't even know what, how basic economics works. They're not thinking about things beyond their locality. Respectfully speaking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to end here. If you want to receive the life of Christ, say these words with me. Father, I thank you for sending your son to die for my sins and raising for my glory. I receive him and I receive his life in Jesus' name. Amen.